If the horse world intrigues you, but you're not quite sure about offering equine portraits, you do not want to miss this episode with two of the world's most respected equine photographers, Emily Hancock and Hannah Freeland of Training Barn. We discuss if and how a pet photographer can also offer horse photography, but then we went well and truly beyond that. We chatted about marketing and why shooting competitions was the opposite of helpful for Hannah trying to book equine portraits. We chatted safety and horse behavior. Then in the members half of this interview, Emily gave us an insight into the world of creating and selling art in the traditional sense. She also shared her experience with a marketing firm for both her portraits and her fine artwork, as well as how she sells her fine artwork to interior designers. Hannah shared exactly how she books great clients through referrals and why clients would fly her to the other side of the world and pay £30,000 for portraits. I do feel like I'm saying this every week at the moment, but honestly, this is an episode not to be missed, especially the members half. So if you're not yet a member, get yourself over to the website and join today. The second half of this episode alone is well and truly worth the 10 bucks that membership will cost you for the month. Welcome to the Pet Photographers Club. Tune in as experts share their insights to help grow your business with higher sales, creative marketing, and kick arse business strategies. Now on to the show. Hello and welcome back to the Pet Photographers Club. I'm your host, Kirsty McConnell, and today I've got two equestrian or equine photographers with us today, Hannah Freeland and Emily Hancock of The Training Barn. Welcome to the club, girls. Hi, thank you for having us. Yeah, hello. (laughs) Thank you very much. Awesome. We were having a bit of a laugh before I press record that it's going to be a bit of a challenge for you all, the listeners, to and myself actually, to work out who's speaking. <laughs> Two similar accents, but I think we're going to cope. <laughs> so maybe the two of you might be better off giving a little intro into who you both are, what the training barn is all about, and how you ended up working together on on this training education platform. Okay, yeah, perfect. So hi, I'm Emily Hancock, and I've been an equestrian photographer and artist for 20-ish years, something like that. And I, for 10 years or so, did lots of commissions and private commissions, event photography, weddings, portrait. And then when I got my fellowship with the British Institute of Professional Photography, lots of photographers wanted to learn from me and know how I was creating the business I had. And so I set up the training barn and I started off with just sort of one-to-one clients who would come to my studio and I'd work on their businesses with them and then Hannah in fact was one of those people (laughs) who her a very good friend of hers actually bought her a whole year's mentorship with me and so I worked closely with Hannah over that year and we transformed her business together and then uh, maybe a couple of years later, I think it was, I had a very random telephone conversation (laughs) with Hannah where suddenly I sort of told her that if she wanted half of the training barn, (laughs) if she'd do my website for me, we could work together. So, uh, and then the last sort of seven or eight years, is it something like that? We've been working, training photographers to create successful equine photography businesses together and yeah, that's that's pretty much where we are. Yeah, I think I came in as a bit of the proof of the pudding concept. So as Emily said, I joined her for a one-to-one for a year and came from zero confidence and probably zero belief in that you can create this wonderful equine portrait photographer's life. You don't need huge amounts of investment and backing. You can actually start on absolute zero. And in my case, it was minus a couple of pounds and you just have to get your head down and and work hard and so once we had transformed my business and it was you know flourishing it was a no-brainer to come in and help others which is why Emily and I run the training barn together because we want as many people as possible to know that 
you can have this wonderful equine photographer's life as well. Mm -hmm. beautiful wow that's such a nice story I mean I would not have guessed that that's you know went from like a student to student to yeah I'm not I'm not sure Emily was totally convinced at the start that half the business was just going I think I convinced her that that was the agreement and that's just what (laughs) happened but yeah neither or hopefully I can say for both of us neither of us have looked back and and it's a very very fulfilling work alongside the ability to be creative through our own businesses which is the perfect combination really yeah yeah definitely actually on that note I know Emily your focus now is really on selling art and we're going to get into that in a moment and Hannah yours you're still creating equine portraits uh, horse and rider portraits as well yes as well so what is kind of the breakdown if you don't mind sharing with the audience for each of you individually between like percentage of income that comes from training and how much is coming from shooting for you Hannah and and your art for you Emily sure so it's always been quite a difficult one this actually because there's real ups and downs in as a creative in a creative industry there are seasonal you know we all know that we make most of our money sort of May, June, July, August, September time. And then most photographers <laughs> go through the winter blues, so oh. to speak, where none of us have saved for our tax bills <laughs> and <laughs> have a complete meltdown come January. But overall, if sorry, if I understand your question correctly, my income is split up basically 80% selling art and photography and about 20% is training and that also goes for effort and input so probably slightly less actually than 20% training throughout the year but there or thereabouts. Okay right well that's great to hear because sometimes you know we hear that it's really like 95% training and 5% shooting so yeah it's really nice to hear that you're still like. We we, Hannah and I sorry to interrupt Hannah and I have always been quite clear that the training barn is a side business it's not to take over our main businesses that we both run because we want to be able to do both really well and give full focus to but actually during COVID of course that percentage did change because we were able to do a lot of online training and hardly any actual physical work the Mm. the percentages did switch a bit there but we've been very keen to sort of switch back into our normal way of working which is about 80 percent on our own businesses Mm -hmm. okay nice and Hannah sorry that's around the same for you as well Yeah. And I think it's, as Emily said, it's more the input and effort. 20% of my revenue certainly comes from the training barn, but I would say 80% that comes from my private commissions is because 80% of my time and effort is going, you know, onto yards. I, I photograph overseas as well. So you know, if I'm photographing out in Dubai, it's not just, you know, jump on a a plane, uh, one shoot and come back. I'm out for three days. And then of course, there's another couple of days. So Emily and I tend to stick between one day a a week for the training barn, be it that we're training in person, or we're working on the training barn. And we do have a small team behind us who run the sort of social media and things. So we're lucky that our time when it is put into the training barn is for our training clients. And then with our businesses, we're obviously doing a lot more of the admin ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, okay, let's rewind a little bit because I think it was, Emily, you mentioned, yeah, that you, in the very beginning of your photography career, you were doing everything, including weddings. Was that the same for you as well? Yeah, I dipped my toe into pretty much everything. And the the biggest thing I found, because I did a lot of eventing and I worked on a one-to-one basis with riders to do the behind the scenes. And what I kind of figured out after doing weddings, christenings, families, or less of families, but, and then the eventing was that I don't like it if I'm not in control. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if they don't jump across country jump in the way I wanted them to jump it, I can't ask them to do it again because I want a better shot. So I figured out pretty quickly, same with the wedding. I, I can't control everything about a wedding. So I didn't fully enjoy it. And if I'm not fully enjoying it, I, I just won't do my best job 
Um, Mm -hmm. Whereas Emily's much more able to create, be creative, even if she's not in full control. Okay, so that leads me to my next question then. I can understand why you've specialized, Hannah in particular, but what about for the listener who's maybe hearing this and they're thinking, okay, I'm a pet photographer or I'm a bit of a generalist, you know, I photograph families, pets, maybe sometimes even the occasional wedding. Is there room in a business like that to also be offering equine portraits or do you believe this, for either of you, you're welcome to answer this, Mm. do you believe that it's really important to be a a 100% focused niche down into only offering anything related to horses in terms of photography? Yes, so this comes up quite a lot actually with our training barn clients. I think it's completely possible to offer lots of different genres of photography. I did for, for many years. The reason niching helps a business potentially be successful a bit quicker is because you're able to put all your energy and effort into one marketing strategy whereas when I had when I was photographing families and horses and weddings it was essentially running three different businesses I had to have a marketing strategy to attract wedding clients which of course is a completely different place from where I needed to get my equine clients and again a different place for where I needed to get my family clients so although it is completely possible and many people enjoy the variety and like working like that both Hannah and I niche down because okay we love horses it you know the the businesses were doing well in that area because our passions lie in that genre so but it meant that we were able to fully focus 100% of our efforts on getting one specific client instead of three or four or five different versions target markets Mm. and I Mm, think the same goes for even if you've niched down into equine I saw a huge when I was doing behind the scenes eventing I would photograph lots of different people and say I'd photograph one high profile rider who has lots of owners I could never turn that owner into booking me for a portrait photography session and it's because I was I'd put myself into a box of I'm happy to be stood you know on on an event ground for 12 hours capturing all of this and then you'll pay me x amount of pounds but now I want to come to a yard and do a tenth of that time. So I'll stand here for an hour and a half or two hours doing a portrait shoot, but I want you to pay me more money because it's more curated, more creative. And so that market was really difficult to figure out that I had to drop the eventing if I wanted the higher end market of portraiture, or I had to drop the portraiture if I wanted to stay with the behind the scenes eventing. That's really interesting because I would have assumed that by doing eventing, that was basically like you were a walking billboard, you know, it was marketing for you. Yes, Um, exactly what I thought for many, many years. And I tried most things and I had the most wonderful clients, you know, knowing my name, you know, great horse owners that were ideal market, target market for portrait photography. But they got to know me as someone who's willing to stand out in the rain photographing their horse doing a dressage test. And ultimately, there's always a cap on how much that image can be sold for. If I'm selling it commercially, then obviously there's a higher ticket. But to the owner of the horse, they're really not going to look over sort of 15 to 50 pounds, let's say, put a cap on it, 50 pounds a shot. I mean, and that's being very, very generous. And so it's very hard to take that client into the realms of a portrait client who's then going to spend a thousand pounds on an image. Mm -hmm. And yet today, your clients, I'm imagining, correct me if I'm wrong, they are competitive writers, aren't they? Yeah, so I mean, I would say we we probably, again, a bit like the training barn and the businesses. For me personally, I would say I probably have 20%, even less actually, probably 10% of my clients are competitive riders. 90% of my clients... Professionally. Yes, professionally. 90% of my clients are ladies and gentlemen who keep their horses on a livery yard or at home who just want beautiful memories because it's, as I always say, it's the only insurance we can have against time is, is, you know, taking those memories and being able to look back on them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
Okay, that makes sense. So if I take that client of yours who you said, you know, they're ladies and gentlemen who, you know, have horses at home and mm-hmm. they're not, you know, spending all of their energy training all the time for, yep. for competition, that client is, that's a client that I used to photograph horses for as well back when I was offering horses when I was in Australia. Mm-hmm. So I was primarily a pet photographer, dogs, but I grew up riding and so it made sense for me to also take on the occasional horseshoe every now and again. Yeah. So that's actually your primary client. And so do you have the opposite of what I had and what most of our listeners would have where you're being booked because you're the horse expert in terms of photography, Yeah. you're coming to their stable or, or wherever, you're yeah. photographing the horse there. And are you also including dogs on occasion or, or other yeah. animals that they have? Absolutely. I The more the merrier. So most of my clients will include family members, be it children, husband or wife or partner, their dogs. I've had cats, chickens, donkeys, llamas, alpacas, turtles. <laughs> the, the more you can include actually in the shoots generally plays out in the viewing after is that they will buy more images and more spend more with you because they've got a bigger variety to pick from and yeah. So, mm-hmm. so yeah it's it's always nice when people have extra animals yeah. that can join the shoot Emily and I are always a great believer as well as nurturing our clients and it's very very often that you'll be commissioned to photograph say a lady and and her horse and then she calls you back to do a family shoot because they like the way we photograph them and they like the way we make them feel so even if you're not advertising yourself as a family photographer you often find that your existing clients will book you for other types of photography because they like the way you shoot or 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 the results or both Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, so that's very interesting then. I was, and this is probably still right, but I was assuming that your clients were, they were booking you because you're the horse expert, which that must be the case, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then they're still booking you as a dog's photographer, their kid's photographer or whatever, even though you're not representing yourself anywhere as the dog expert. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. But that's because I think when you're on a shoot with someone, you have conversation about their family and, who, you know, what they do. And no doubt a ch- child's birthday comes up and you'll go, oh, wouldn't it be lovely to have a photo shoot of all you guys? You know, so you're kind of dropping seeds whilst you're making a relationship with that person anyway of course if you want family shoots but like Hannah says many of the equine clients are actually very loyal clients you know for for many of my equine clients I've done christenings family shoots weddings the whole lot and because I like them and they like me then it makes sense and they know that I can do it because at some point in the relationship I've said oh yeah I used to be a wedding photographer yeah. for 10 years yeah, I loved it but you know it was time for me to to move on or whatever and they go oh she's getting married next year do you think <laughs> they're doing it for us and I you know that and then you have a choice don't you so I think also the fact that Emily and I have both done weddings and we've both done indoor eventing as well as outdoor eventing. We've really pushed ourselves against all the elements that are tough to photograph in. So you're, you know, you have no control over an event. You don't know where everyone is at all times. It could be low light situations like indoor show jumping, the same with a wedding. So when it comes to could you just also photograph my dog? We've kind of done all the hard bits and then we've niched down into what we feel is the easy bit. And it's the easy bit because we enjoy it. So for someone who wouldn't enjoy portrait photography, but they do enjoy eventing, they'd find the eventing much easier and much more enjoyable. So we always stick to the things we enjoy because we're better at them. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. So let me flip it upside down now, this example. So most of our listeners are primarily dog photographers. Mm -hmm. Some also do cats or whatever, but primarily we're dog photographers in this community. Mm -hmm. And some people have experience working with horses as well and some none at all. Mm -hmm. Is it still possible for a dog photographer to start out of nowhere marketing horse photography or equine sessions, whatever you want to call them, Mm -hmm. 
and to do it safely. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. If they want to, of course. I think what's most important is to learn the basics of horse behavior, horsemanship. And you can do that online, of course. Probably YouTube will tell you everything you need to know in terms of safety. But I would suggest that probably most of your community at some time or other have had a connection with someone that owns a horse, be it one of your photography clients or a friend, friend of the family, someone loosely linked to your your current network. And my suggestion would be to contact those people that have any connection with horses and go and speak to them, particularly if you've had absolutely no horse experience whatsoever, go speak to them, go visit their yard start to understand safety aspects of of working with horses and horse behavior and then go go from there so yeah it's it's definitely possible but you do have to do a little bit of I, I suppose it's probably not quite the same as going from photographing a dog to a child because no. I'd say they're kind of similar yeah. you know in terms Fast. of yeah <laughs> <laughs> difficult to photograph yeah. um, all over the place whereas horses with them being you know, five ton beasts or however <laughs> heavy they are, they're, they're very heavy. Yeah. Um, that there is a safety aspect. Mm-hmm. But, but much like photographing newborn babies, you would have to go and do your research and learn and get the knowledge about posing a newborn baby mm. as much as the safety around horses. And I think if you have the ability to have a look on something like Pinterest or Google Images, you need to assess how people are posing horses with dogs and and really look at the image. And there's a reason why they've put the dog, you know, the other side of the human, of the owner, rather than, you know, you learn so much having the experience. So Emily and I know that most dogs will not turn their back on a horse because to a dog that's unsafe so a lot of photographers will come into a situation and say can you just turn your dog around and get him to sit in front of the horse and you're constantly trying to push the the dog's bottom down because the dog knows that's unsafe it's you know it can't see behind it while it's sat there so if you analyze a gallery of images that you've pulled up that you like you'll start realizing that there's a stable in between the dog and the horse or a human or the dog's the other side so it's that sort of thing that you need to have knowledge of. yeah knowledge of Mm -hmm. that's a really good example actually and I loved your answers to that question it's exactly how I would answer if somebody asked me I've never had a pet dog before I don't know anything about dogs can I start photographing dogs <laughs> yeah. yeah my answer would be exactly the same yes but you have to learn animal behavior dog behavior yeah that's you know not that hard but you have to put the put the time in and then yeah start by practice and it's exactly what you have to do with any genre as you gave it the example as well with newborns super important too I'm always terrified when I hear somebody is starting with newborns and they don't know anything about them like myself I don't know anything about them so yeah really good to hear you guys saying that as well and also encouraging to the the listener who you know has seen beautiful horse portraits like the the both of you create and are inspired and wanting to do it but are a bit intimidated to hear you guys say that is uh, it's great that you know they they can get into it if they want to now I have so much more that I want to ask you both but I think we're going to save it for the second half of this interview which is for members only because otherwise I am going to be keeping you all day but I know like Hannah you've got clients that spend up to like 20,000 pounds and so Certainly, I want to get into that. Emily, your focus these days is on selling art. And I really want to talk to you about that because I know you're working with with agents about that. So let's save that for the second half of this interview. But before we do that and we wrap up part one, maybe either of you can just give the listener a bit of an idea about what the training barn offers, how it is that, yeah, the best place that we can go to find out more about that. Sure. So we've obviously got a website, www.trainbarn.co.uk. Our main goal is to help people be successful, give them a blueprint, give them an action plan to get them to a point in their business where they can either pay their mortgage, they can pay all their bills, they can become full-time photographers if they want to. We have worked with lots of people who want it as a part-time job. So really, we've got a lot of skill in, obviously, we can do the photography. That's kind of a given. We've spent many years honing our craft there. 
But what people really, really gain from us is the business knowledge. Most creatives struggle with the business side, marketing themselves, knowing how and why and where to market and how to get those clients that will actually pay Mm. you a decent enough rate that you are actually able to sustain your own business and pay your mortgage and you know go on holidays and stuff so we really focus on that in the training barn so that we're able to help people create their own successful equine businesses and we do we have online courses as well as in-person courses so we have loads of people from all over the world who learn so it's not necessary you have to be from the UK our marketing plans and photography plans work whether you're in America or France or Germany or England and there are so many more horse owners out there than there are horse photographers that we are only just scratching the surface and so we want lots and lots and lots more of you guys to connect with us so that we can show you a little bit of how wonderful this life is. And just one last thing to say, I I think the reason so many people connect with our training is because we are very, very open and transparent. You know, no question is silly. We will answer it absolutely honestly. And we will give all the examples we possibly can about both Hannah and I's 20 year journeys through you know the photography business all the highs all the lows and it's important to us we want to send people away from the training barn highly motivated with an action plan that if they implement is going to get them real results so yeah that's that's kind of us absolutely (laughs) awesome (laughs) i will put the links to training barn as well as your each of your photography websites as well in the show notes so if you guys are listening missed you know the link or whatever don't stress I've got all the notes for you in the show notes you can just head over to the petphotographersclub.com slash the dash podcast this will be season 14 episode 6 so you can type in 1406 to find that one that's it for part 1 of the episode but if you're a member of the club of course you can continue listening to part 2 in the member zone or via your private RSS feed in your favorite podcast player. Don't forget, if you're not a member yet, you can join. It's just 10 bucks a month. Club membership includes loads of perks and bonus content. So head on over to the petphotographersclub.com to find out more. Thanks for listening to the Pet Photographers Club. To subscribe to the podcast, check out other episodes, and keep up to date, head to thepetphotographersclub.com.